2 verse 23 him being delivered by the determinant counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain that's chapter 2 23 him that is Jesus of Nazareth being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain now there are various responses that people may have and thoughts about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ some people it is just something horrible that happened something terrible that happened to others they would just feel pity towards him and a very sad scene of the death of Christ we're speaking on this very special day Good Friday on the death of the Lord Jesus and what it means to us to some it promotes a sense of uh, piousness in a way that they would somehow want to try to be able to take on a similar manner themselves and uh, to somehow deny themselves and if they could be in a way crucified no, are you here tonight? no we're here Sunday I see Sunday I've got to go on business the, to some the uh, denial they would deny Jesus Christ so it's, um, they, they would just want to forget about it um, you can wonder today how many people have stopped to think that it was the anniversary of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ we stopped for various things one person killed and there'd be a, a stopping I'll just shut this door because of the noise yeah, we'll, we'll uh, stop for all sorts of things uh, but this is a very solemn uh, remembrance although it's not an official Sunday as it were, it's nevertheless a day that the church recognises uh, that we should remember the death of the Lord Jesus Christ so it's a very worthy thing but it's the teaching that's important and it's something to understand every day of the year it's such an important thing that we shouldn't just reserve thinking about what it meant that Christ died for one day of the year but the whole whole year we preach Christ crucified the Apostle Paul said and he didn't just preach it once a year he preached it every day all through the year so the various responses now others might say well it's something very amazing isn't it what happened but well it's something that must be from God so we couldn't possibly understand it we couldn't take some authority or rely upon such a thing that is for us far too vast to possibly understand and of course there are things in the scriptures that are more difficult to understand than others there are things about God that people have discussed true people who really love God and have a true faith real Christians don't agree about everything but when it comes to the death of Christ there are certain things that are important to understand and to have a real priority that's given over to this matter now how do we understand well simply there are a couple of things in this verse particularly about it being God's determinate counsel and foreknowledge God's plan and certainly there was great wickedness involved two things here but the first point before we come to these is that we need the Bible we need the Bible we can't understand anything about the death of Christ uh, the resurrection where he came from who he is where he's gone without the Bible some people have a vague belief in God and uh, apply to God a uh, natural morality that we might think well this is good and bad and God must accept us on the basis of what we do but the Bible teaches very differently about the state of man where we've come from the fall of man in the Garden of Eden for example 
the, and very importantly, the things about Jesus Christ. So when it comes to understanding what it means, Good Friday, what does it mean? Christ was crucified. Then we need the Bible because there we have particularly the accounts, don't we, in the Gospels. And we have the early church being taken, given the Holy Spirit to be able to uh, teach what the life and death of Christ actually was for and what it meant. Some of it was indicated in the Old Testament. Some of it Jesus alluded to and said a little bit more of in places. But it comes mainly then in the Acts of the Apostles, which um, you could say is invisibly joined to the Gospel of Luke because it's the same author and he continues in the same manner as he begins the um, account, the former treatise of all that Jesus began both to do and teach he had given he refers to in Acts 1 and verse 1 and then so he's referring back to what Jesus began to do and here what he continues to do by the Holy Spirit so if we had the Bible and people were clear and believed the Bible which is the word of God it's, it's a revelation you know when you really understand that the Bible is the word of God people will mock you they think you're ridiculous but you'll have great help from the Lord it's wonderful to know that we've got God's word we're not guessing what the crucifixion of Jesus was about because God has given us his word and very good it is too in Psalm 119 and in verse 9 the psalmist uh, writes wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way well if there's young men here who are seeking to cleanse their way or there may be older people men or women wanting to cleanse their way how how could we cleanse our way well it replies by taking heed thereto according to thy word people are searching all over the place today where wouldn't they just like to know that there was a book the bible that told you how it gave you the word to take heed to to be a guide to your life to cleanse your way, not only just to tell you what to do, but in a good and godly way. That's why it's not always what people want, of course, preparing, prepare, <coughs> preparing to go our own ways. And it may be wondered today whether it's like the days that Amos prophesied. See, once upon a time, <coughs> not everywhere, but in certain parts of the land, people were familiar with the Bible. They had, they had Bibles in their homes, not many other books, not televisions. We might go back to even before they had theatres and cinemas. Uh, they probably had theatres, but not uh, cinemas. And there wasn't much to do, much to read. They may have, even before newspapers, there weren't many of them around till the 19th century, but people had Bibles. Amazing. God's word had come, and we could be, some of them obviously didn't read them, they preferred to get drunk, but there was much of the Bible and it was known and so lots of phrases have come into our language today <coughs> taken from, from, from the Bible but uh, the general gist of it has been forgotten about it's thought something that's not needed anymore but Amos 8 and verse 11 he says behold the days come saith the Lord uh, that I the Lord God that I will send a famine in the land can you imagine if God was going to send a famine so there'd be no food in, in Sainsbury's next week. Can you imagine how mm -hmm. we'd be? We wouldn't want that, would we? But he says, no, uh, not a famine of bread. You're going to be okay for bread. No, no a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Now, that wouldn't bother most people. But it was expected here, when Amos was writing, to shock people. They had God with them. They'd known God's blessing. And they were told there might be a famine coming, not of bread and, and water. They'd still have food, but they wouldn't be hearing the word of God. And it was a shocking thing to think that that, that might come upon a people who'd known God's blessing. 
and they shall wonder. It says, this is this may be, we may think, well, we've got a famine of the word of God today. People are not hearing the word of God. But it said also, there though, there was a hunger, there was a thirst for it, because it says in verse 12, and they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Now there are areas of the country today where churches are few and far between, and people have to travel 20, 30 miles, where our friends here have even come a good distance today, some of them, to be here. Uh, there are maybe other places where churches are more easy to find uh, nearer by some places you're sport for choice almost and people have to decide well I'm going to settle with this church or this one and we'll be friends with the others but in other places it's very sad for people to not find a church and they're seeking to find it and they won't find it but um, it would be a, it would be a, a good thing Today, if there were people looking around and seeking to find, to hear the word of God, well, there are some. So, the importance then of the word of God for knowing about Jesus Christ. This is our first and only place to which we can turn. Uh, secondly then, God's word here in this text, verse 23, speaks of, we're speaking of the crucifixion here, of the, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Well, we talked about those different ways people feel about the crucifixion, how bad it was, how terrible, what a tragedy. And then others, they have some sort of hope in it. But here we see it was the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. God was in it. So you might get into a terrible state today. Some predicament. If totally without a solution in sight. But if you know that you're following the Lord God of the Bible, you can have an assurance that there is a determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. God is working. That old hymn, isn't it? God is working his purposes out. And so it is that this is what's going on. And this was happening in the cross, in Christ being crucified. God had a definite plan and purpose in it. And now the important thing is for us is, well, what does that have to do with us? So, in uh, we see in Isaiah 53, if we went back to the Old Testament, how there was this spoken of so many hundred years before, was it eight, seven or eight hundred years before Isaiah was writing, Isaiah 53 some of these texts which are picked up in the New Testament here Isaiah 53 verse 4 surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows who? well we're going to have to realise this is Jesus Christ bearing our griefs carrying our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. You see, smitten, stricken of God and afflicted on the cross, yet he's bearing our griefs, carrying our sorrows. Being spoken about all this long way before in the Old Testament and in the next verse, 5, very plain, explaining the purpose of God. He was wounded for our transgressions. That's the great substitutionary death of Christ he was wounded for our transgressions bearing our sins he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we're healed is that your understanding of the cross of Christ it's bearing our sins bearing our griefs our sorrows wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities and in verse 6 all we like sheep have gone astray that's our sin we've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all all our iniquity laid on Jesus Christ this smitten 
stricken, afflicted, rejected of men. You see who this is talking about? It's not talking about Jeremiah. It's not talking about Israel as a whole. It's talking about Jesus Christ. Which is why this chapter of Isaiah is rarely read in <coughs> Jewish circles because they are too much challenged by it as being the truth in Christ. Let's go to verse 8 and the end of verse 8. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And in verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. See there, the purpose of God, it pleased the Lord. The crucifixion, it pleased the Lord. You think it, we're just trying to blame it on Pilate and Herod, aren't we? And on all those that shouted out, crucify him. But it pleased, the, that's, a, that's a strange view of pleasure. Some people say this is cruel. There are some, even today, who are ministers in churches. They say, we don't want this teaching. We think this is cosmic child abuse, one call it. It's direct, but this is God's word. We have to rely on his word. We've already said that, haven't we? We can't go about making up our own theories. We need God's teaching on the crucifixion. Now, I tell you, there's going to be a hope here. Because look, if we went back to verse 6, on him, he hath laid on him the iniquity of us all, You'd say, well, here's some hope for me. I've got a lot of iniquity. I'm maybe not a murderer or some other kind of notorious criminal, but I'm not a holy person. I'm not someone that loves God with all my heart and soul as I'm meant to. I've been quite selfish in many ways. I wish I'd been better, but I know I haven't. And I know God's a fair judge. And he'll see all my sin on Judgment Day. But here we've got one and it says, The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So you see there's a hope in the cross of Christ. That it wasn't just some mistake. It wasn't just something dreadful that happened. But that Jesus Christ was bearing the sin of many. It's wonderful to read about this. And in verse uh, 10, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. An offering for sin. His soul an offering in the Old Testament, they brought lambs and goats. Uh, did goats were offered? I don't know. Yeah, I think there were goats. Yes, there was a scapegoat and the other yeah, goat right. was, yes. And then there was, uh, there weren't pigs, that was that's not, not right for some reason. But there was um, oxen, nice big cattle brought, and, uh, and sometimes little birds, and other things were offered as offerings for sin. Never a human sacrifice, that would have been a terrible thing to do. But here, his soul is an offering for sin. Now he can offer a goat, or he can offer an ox, but to offer Jesus Christ. Now we read elsewhere in the Bible that Jesus Christ was the eternal Son of God in heaven, who was born of a virgin, manifest in the flesh, and then gave himself in this way as a full sacrifice his whole life his whole coming into the world but particularly in his death there was an offering for sin it says in the bible that the old blood of goats could never really take away our sins it was something of a covering for our sins but here is a full sufficient and perfect sacrifice jesus christ at the end of verse 11 again uh, it said well, in verse 11 he shall see of the travail of his soul. And shall, so there wasn't be an end. He, he, that wasn't the end of him. He was going to see of it, his work. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. And we know again from the scriptures that to justify means to make a verdict. A justify that right. Whereas they might have appeared in the court, they've got to be either justified or condemned, acquitted. Uh, or condemned, justified, justified. They're counted righteous. This is what he can do by knowledge of Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? It's not some vague old sacrifice that happened 2,000 years ago that doesn't have any relevance. It has a legal stand. He shall bear their iniquities. And verse 12, the end of verse 12, uh, well, I read the whole of verse 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, He's still got a portion, 
he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressions. He bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. What a hope there is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it wonderful to read about him? In the Bible, you see, you wouldn't have better guess this. If you'd just known that 2,000 years ago Jesus was this wonderful man that went around doing miracles and was crucified, you'd say, ah, oh, wouldn't you? But here, we have something quite amazing about him. And this is quoted in the New Testament in places like Romans chapter 4, at the end of the passage we've been looking at recently, mainly in the evenings. Uh, Romans chapter 4 verse 25 it quotes this from Isaiah and says after speaking about his righteousness being imputed to all that like Abraham believed they believed and it was counted to Abraham for righteousness and says it was the same for those who believe and trust as it were on Jesus Christ um, it's imputed to them their faith is imputed to them if we believe on him that raised up our Lord Jesus from the dead it shall be imputed as well and for righteousness verse 22 verse 25 just this summary of Isaiah here who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification now if you've ever tried to be a good person which I, I trust we all do try in, a, in our own way you realize it how much you fail the harder you try sometimes the more you think if you've got, um, especially if people can give you sort of a bit of advice and you take it and you know, listen to them, they say, look, this is what you really like, do you know? And you say, oh, do you know I was quite that bad? But some other others of us, we realise quicker various sins, but there's a whole range of sins. And, you know, there's no way we could be righteous. But by faith in this death of the Lord Jesus Christ, a sinner is counted righteous. So this is... this purpose of God. It, this death of Christ, it wasn't a, uh, a just something that happened. It was the determinate counsel of God that this Christ would come into the world and be offered as a sacrifice for sinners. Well, the question is, do you trust upon him? Is he your saviour? Well, I, I was going to go on to talk about the wickedness there was. Uh, this, this doesn't deny great wickedness uh, this him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain and you think well oh, we've got two things here on the one hand God was doing this Jesus Christ was coming to be a sacrifice to save all that believe and turn to him and now we're saying that it was wicked but, well this is as we might say, one of those things. That, and in fact, to maybe just come to a simple application of it, that though this is a, a great plan of God, he did use evil. Now, and the blame of the wickedness is fully upon those who crucified him. They are guilty, yet it was God's purpose. Now, some of us, we take a simple view and we accept such things. And it is right that we do that. And we don't, in a way, argue with God and say, well, it's not my fault, it was your plan, or anything like this. It's not the way that it works. And in fact, we know elsewhere in the Scripture, God's ways are higher and greater than all of ours. And so, in fact, what we can say is that when there's any wickedness or when there's any evil, God's purposes won't be thwarted by it. But in fact, it'll be as it is in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, where all things work together for good to those that know and love God. To those who continue opposed to God, <coughs> we're all caught up in this wickedness. We're all caught up in sin. There is no hope for us at all. But in the worst of circumstances, think the holy son, Jesus Christ and then when there was that that, that trial and Pilate realised that he wanted to wash his hands of the matter 
which is of course where we get the phrase wash our hands of, of, it comes from <coughs> the, they said they didn't want Jesus to be set free they wanted Barabbas a criminal set free and they all got caught up in this like a mob mentality but all this wickedness when Peter was preaching here in Acts chapter 2 of Pentecost he was preaching to people said, you are wicked people. So you were pointing the finger at them. You have crucified this saviour who by the determinant purpose, counsel, foreknowledge of God, <coughs> this is all in his plan. But then the great thing that is in his plan as well is for a great multitude of people to be saved from their sin. And so the wickedness the wickedness is under God people like to give this illustration that there's that there's uh, God and there's the devil and there's this ongoing war between them well in a sense there is but the, the conclusion of the matter is firm and stated and Satan is, is has a limited restrained power it's very bad for us Satan's stronger than us but God is far, far stronger. And though we may be tempted by Satan's schemes, taken up with them, and, and taken astray for a while, we to return always to Jesus Christ. Well, I'm, I'm really trying to summarise all, all this rather quickly, rather than de dealing with this at, at, any, at any length, to, to show you that though there is great evil in that day of the crucifixion, of Jesus Christ it was bringing about this wonderful salvation of Christ bear, bearing the very sin of those that were against him and so it is that since the fall of man from the garden of Eden it's, we said in Isaiah they've all like lost sheep gone astray and if you spend time in with Christian friends etc and then you're if you go into a very worldly place just think there's a whole range of people completely far from God going off in every direction you think are they sinning against God by not giving him any glory and yet for such Christ has died for all that come and put their trust in him well that's our position then we are those wicked people we are those who would if we had been there would have got caught up with the mob shouting crucify him. We wouldn't want this breaking into our society with this message that all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God and we can't trust in ourselves for our everlasting life. We must put our whole trust in Jesus Christ. And you see, the wonderful thing about this, this we were saying yesterday, amazing grace last week we were speaking about, is that this is a full and sufficient saviour who Jesus is that we can turn to him well let's just conclude in, in, a, in a prayer now as we to, to turn our hearts to God we haven't quite finished yet um, we'll just come for a quiet prayer and then we'll sing again in a moment but let's pray Heavenly Father, we thank Thee that the death of Christ was a sacrifice for sin and that we're all sinners and that we were like sheep going astray. We thank Thee that Christ not only died but rose again, that He reigns in heaven, that He's coming to judge the whole world, all in the stand before Him, both <laughs> those who've already died and those who are still alive will all be brought to him and Lord we thank thee that there is now a day of salvation before judgment comes and we're all called upon to put our whole trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and in no other and Lord we thank thee that whatever wickedness we see in the world and, and, and in ourselves Lord if Jesus is our saviour we need not be afraid because thou dost have this determinate counsel 
and full knowledge to bring all things to pass for thy glory and the great glory goes to the Lord Jesus Christ who is the good shepherd of the sheep who yet gave himself as the Lamb of God the full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice for all sins of all that come to him and Lord may we be found not making the mistake of the Jews of old of trying to establish our own righteousness but may we come and put our trust in the blood and the righteousness of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and Lord turn as we pray day by day from trusting in ourselves to trusting in him alone and in thy good will and pleasure and bringing all things to pass for thy glory and we thank thee Lord that the glory of heaven is filled with Jesus Christ and his wonderful means of salvation as we would be brought into eternity to meet thee Father, Son and Holy Ghost with a wonder and a love that we can barely start to imagine Lord what thou hast prepared for those that love thee for those that long for the appearing again of the Lord Jesus when he comes again he will not come to die but he will come to reign and Lord he will bring all his people safely because they are saved because he is the Saviour. O oh Lord, be merciful to us and cause us all to put our whole trust only in the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.